this morning. I want to begin the service with a reading of God's Word, and we're going to read from Romans chapter 8. So if you want to follow me in your Bible, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6.
Well, when you study church history, you really come face to face with the formation of Christianity's most basic statement of faith, developing through the years. The early church was forced to answer some of the same questions, or we would say the same challenges that we have today. They had to answer questions like, who is Jesus really? Um, questions like, how can God be three persons in one being? What's the proper role of the church in salvation? What constitutes the inspired books of the Bible? Those questions and many more were raised and answered in the, what was called the Universal Church Councils. Now the key to understanding the orthodox teachings that, that came from these councils, you have to look at the heresies surrounding them. Because these councils, especially the earliest ones, were essentially anti-heresy conventions. Uh, they were called to sort out the true apostolic teachings from the false teachings of the heretics. And no sooner had one standard of orthodoxy been established and defended than the church had to rush to the defense of another. And when you look at all that, all of those universal church councils were important in their time. But only some of them stand out as having a lasting significance on the faith and in the life and ministry of the church today. Uh, there's a few of them. The first one is the First Council of Nicaea in 325. It's one of the earliest heresies to rear its head was Arianism. Which, essential, which asserted really that Christ was created by the Father, later adopted as the Son. Uh, they refuted this heresy by declaring that Jesus Christ is one being with the Father. And out of that came what we call the Nicene Creed. Take your hymn book this morning, and in the back of the hymn, hymnal, We have in the hymnal, well, it's not in the very back, but you'll find on page, well, I don't know if I ought to give out the page number or not. Page 666. <laughs> on page 666, you have the Apostles' Creed at the top, and then you have the Nicene Creed. Well, we got two different kind of hymnals. Okay, 675. That's better. <laughs> well, let's stand together and read the Nicene Creed. All together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. They reaffirmed in the Nicene Creed that Jesus was God, as it says here, a very God. But even at the end, if you'll notice, there's a problem. Because even at the end, it says, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. That's not quite right, is it? We're not saved by baptism. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our study today in Galatians, we're returning to that first general council of the church that was held in Jerusalem about A.D. 50. The council decided that the Gentile converts to Christianity were not to be obligated to keep the feasts and the, the fasts of the Jewish tradition. They weren't, they didn't, they weren't obligated to keep the, uh, the rituals of Judaism, including the rules concerning circumcision of males. The council did retain some prohibitions, though, on eating blood and meat not containing blood. That's why if we go out to eat anywhere, I always order my steak well done. <laughs> I don't want any blood in it. The Bible says don't eat blood. Well, I don't. Uh, meat of animals that were strangled, also on fornication and idolatry. That's called the apostolic de decree. You can find that in Acts chapter 15. The accounts of that council, that's where they're found in Acts chapter 15, but also in Paul's letter to the Galatians in Acts chapter 2. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up our study here previously in our study here in Acts chapter 2. It's like watching one of those TV shows where it's continued from week to week and they begin by saying, well, previously, well, previously in our study, we've looked at the council or the conference in Jerusalem. That was in verses 1 through 3. We looked at the period in Paul's life. It was 14 years after his first visit to Jerusalem. He went back to Jerusalem. He went with Barnabas and Paul, or Barnabas and Titus, went with Paul. Those were the participants that went with him to this council. And the purpose of his attendance there was obedience to God's revelation. God spoke to him and said, I need you to go to this council. And he went there to confirm the gospel message. And his desire there was to overthrow really the power and influence of the false teachers. He wanted confirmation that the gospel of grace that he preached to the Gentiles was the same gospel proclaimed to the, by the rest of the apostles. That it was the same message. So that the message of the Judaizers, those false teachers, they would be exposed as being the heretics. They were the ones that would be exposed as be, having a perversion of the truth of the gospel. And ever since Paul's time, it's important for us to understand the enemy has been trying to add something to the simple gospel of grace. Even in the Nicene Creed, one baptism for the remission of sins. Well, that's an addition. They tell us, these false teachers, that a person is saved by faith in Christ plus something else. Maybe it's good works. The Judaizers said the law of Moses. In our day and age, people might add baptism or church membership, some kind of religious ritual. And Paul, along with the, Ju the Jerusalem council, made it clear that all of these teachers are false. The gospel, and actually in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul basically said that these teachers, these false teachers, these who pervert the gospel, we could call them gospel perverts. I don't know if that's, in my day and age, being called a pervert was really a nasty thing. <laughs> I don't know if it is in our day and age now, but Paul calls them that. If you are 
changing the gospel, if you are adding to the gospel, you're perverting it. It's a perversion. It's a serious thing to miss and tamper with the good news, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it really is. It's a serious thing. And Paul takes his stand here at this council. Well, I want us to pick up the story beginning in verse 2 and looking first of all, number 2 in your, on the back of your bulletin is the consultation with church leaders. Paul comes to this council, this conference in Jerusalem, and the first thing he does, he has this consultation with church leaders. And he describes who they are in verse 9. In verse 9, he tells us, that Peter, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. So the, the church leaders that he meets with there is Peter. Now that he says James, understand that that's the Lord's brother, the same person that wrote in the Bible, the book of James. James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostle John. If you look at it in our day and age, and look at it in our terminology, it's like they're doing committee work before they present their findings or their recommendations to the General Assembly. Because when you look in Acts chapter 15, it looks like, well, there is this General Assembly and they come up with this decision because they have this big discussion. Well, no, they presented their recommendations and their recommendations were adopted. He first met in private. He had this private meeting with church leaders. And if you look how he describes these church leaders, if you look at verse two, he says, he calls them those who seemed to be leaders. In verse six, he says, those who seemed to be important. Verse nine, those reputed to be pillars. Now it sounds like he's being sarcastic, isn't it? Sounds like he's kind of poking at them. You know, these guys think they're, you know, big shots. Well. He's not poking at the apostles. He's poking at these false teachers because the false teachers in their attacks against the apostle Paul told Paul, well, you're not Peter. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter walked on the water. He's certainly more important than you. John, he's a pillar of the church. Where would the church be without Peter and John. And so Paul's expressions were influenced really by the fact that the Judaizers were exaggerating this, the status of these Jerusalem apostles over his. Well, you know, they are important. Paul, you're just, who are you? You're not really even an apostle. But you know, in our day and age, I think we have a tendency to exalt and follow leaders a lot of times more than following Christ, even within the church. Especially in our day and age, when so many pastors, so many church leaders can get on the internet, get on YouTube, or especially the ones that are on television. And people begin to follow them and follow their teachings, just as if they are inspired just as if they have a true word from God other than what's written in the Bible. It just, it is one of those things that kind of sticks in my craw and kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck when I hear any pastor or any Bible scholar say about a book that they have written. And you hear it all the time. You read this book. And the principles that I've explained here, and it'll change your life forever. No, it won't. It's a book. It's your opinion. The only book that will change your life forever is this book right here. Now, I might write a book on something and say it'll help, but it'll help if it explains this book and what God says. We gotta be careful. Paul says, yeah, he, he, his words really are not a denial of, nor they are a mark of disrespect for anybody with that apostolic authority. 
but he's indicating that he accepts their office as apostles, but he's not in all of them. He's not intimidated by them. In fact, he says we're all equal in God's sight. And we are. You know, a lot of pastors get in trouble because congregations begin to put them up on a pedestal and feed their ego when suddenly they feel like they're more important than anybody else. And I'm not. We're all saved by grace through faith. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're all on a pathway. We all depend upon him. And Paul says, we're all equal. I can stand before these men because we're the same when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. But there's also the problem of false teachers. That's letter B in your outline there. But notice he's, he calls them here in verse 4, the matter arose because some false brothers has infiltrated our ranks. He doesn't call them necessarily false teachers. He calls them false brothers. These false brothers were involved in an espionage. They had infiltrated the church as spies. A lot of plots going on here, isn't it? He calls them false, false brothers. In other words, fake Christians. It suggests that they were enemies. Entering a camp by stealth with the goal or the objective of espionage or of sabotage. We're going to blow this whole thing of Christianity up. And so they put false brothers in their midst. And some scholars believe that these false brothers were on a mission, perhaps from the Pharisees or the priests, in order to corrupt the message of the gospel and to cause confusion in the church. In other words, the gospel is spreading rapidly. People are turning to faith in Christ. The Pharisees, those religious leaders, especially in Jerusalem, were losing their power, losing their influence. And so one way to prevent it is to not just persecute the church from without, but let's corrupt it from within. Let's send people in there that will challenge their faith, will challenge their beliefs. Now understand that ultimately Satan is the instigator of this problem. The Judaizers were first of all the devil's agents. When Paul was making his farewell trip before he went to Jerusalem and was arrested and, and put in prison, he gave a warning to the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He tells them, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own member or even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Satan has done more to destroy the work of God through the distortion of the gospel from within the church than from the persecution of the church from the outside. Their specific purpose was to undermine the freedom that these Christians had in, in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to make them, Paul says, a slave. If you'll notice... He says, they had infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Not slaves in the literal sense, but slaves in the spiritual sense of just putting them in bondage to a system of works, a system of salvation that was based upon performance. In Christ Jesus, believers have freedom from the law. You are free from the law this morning because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law is not the way of salvation. You have freedom from its religious ceremonies and regulations as a way of living. We have freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul warns the Galatians that it's impossible to be a legalist. It's impossible to be a Judaizer and to be a Christian. It's impossible to add something to the gospel and still be faithful to Jesus. Look in Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. 
Paul says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But the faith we eagerly await through the Spirit, the righteousness, but by faith we eagerly await the Spirit, through the Spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's strong language. Paul warns them, tells them. The two don't work together. If you add anything to the gospel, then you're obligated to keep the whole law. And nobody can do that. To do a single thing to earn your salvation is to nullify the grace of God. If you think you have to do anything else to be acceptable before God, except what Jesus has already done for you, you cancel it all out. Jesus paid the full price for your salvation on the cross. It's paid for. He now offers it to you as a free gift. It's free. That's grace. And you receive it by faith. Understand that the life we live in Christ is by faith. And we live in Christ through grace. All that we receive from God is by grace. That's important for us to understand. Our acceptance by God is not according to performance. It's by grace. Satan loves to come against us. Satan loves to attack us and convince us. Now you may say, yes, I know that I have been saved by grace through faith. It's not of my own works that I can't boast. Jesus died for me on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin. I don't deserve his love. I can't earn it. But after we receive Christ, how do we try to please God? Many times it's by performance. We fail. We sin. We struggle. We doubt. And we think, how can Jesus accept me now? We get filled with guilt. We get filled with anxiety. We stay away from church. We avoid other believers. Because we think, I just haven't lived up to the standard that Jesus has for me. And that may be true. But that doesn't change your acceptance in Christ. He loves you. He wants you to come to him because he's gracious. He's a loving God. And we are received and accepted by his grace. If I say I have no sin, I deceive myself. That's what it says in 1 John. I have to admit, I'm not perfect. If you have Send it all this week. Understand, you're still under the grace of God. He still has accepted you. He still loves you. And he wants you to come to him. Don't believe the lie that God is going to reject you because of your performance. Because of your works or your lack of works. We are under a totally different kind of law. You know that? In Christ Jesus, believers have been released from the law. This is what we read to begin the service from Romans. Well, this is from Romans chapter 7, verse 6. We have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We we walk in the spirit. We serve in the spirit. Romans 8, verse 2. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life Set us free from the law of sin and death. We are set free not only from the old code of the Mosaic law, which nobody could keep except Jesus. He was perfect. We are set free from the law of Moses. We are set free from the law of sin and death. Jesus gives us freedom 
Freedom from the law, freedom from sin and death. And he does that by his grace, through his spirit. Romans 8 verse 4 said, The righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. If you are living by the Spirit of God, you are living according to the Spirit of God this morning, those righteous requirements of the law are being fulfilled in you and through you as you let the Spirit of God work in your life and transform your life and change you by His Word, through His Spirit. He will enable you to keep the righteous requirements of the law so you focus on the Spirit, not on the law. We are set free. Jesus said, and John recorded it in John 8, verse 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Do you know the freedom that you have in Christ Jesus this morning? Freedom to come to him because of his grace. Well, let's look at number two real quick. Number two is the confirmation of Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry is confirmed. And they do that by confirming there is one message. Letter A there, under the confirmation of Paul's ministry, there is one message. Paul says, they added nothing to my message. He says that. Verse 6, as for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. These men added nothing to my message. The apostles in Jerusalem had contributed nothing to Paul's knowledge or understanding of the gospel or to his authority to spread it. He says in chapter 1, verse 12, that he received, or verse, chapter 1, verse 2, that, that he received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For 17 years, he had preached the gospel without the apostles in Jerusalem correcting his theology. They could add nothing to Paul's message or his ministry. They didn't take anything away. So he's saying there was agreement and there was unity. There is one message, the one gospel for both Jews and Gentiles. They recognized the hand of God at work. God, the same God, who energized and empowered Peter, was the same God that energized and empowered Paul. They recognized the grace that had been given to Paul, God's grace, his free, undeserving, unmerited blessing and empowerment. Only God's grace could account for the proclamation of the gospel and the planting of churches that had been accomplished through the Apostle Paul. They looked at the evidence. Look at what God is doing. They recognize this is the hand of God. But then they also offer the right hand of fellowship. The right hand of fellowship. And that was to make, the right hand of fellowship was to make a solemn vow of friendship. The right hand of fellowship was a mark of partnership. It was a tangible expression of unity and agreement. They are standing together, offering the right hand of fellowship, saying, we are in agreement, we are in unity, we are one together with the Apostle Paul. We are unified. One message. Jesus died for you on the cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day, and now offers you eternal life, and has ascended into heaven, and is exalted at the right hand of the Father. One message that will transform and change your life. They agreed together. It was a tangible expression of unity and agreement. So there was one message, but there was also different ministries. They recognized that God had given different ministries to different men. Peter had centered his ministry primarily among the Jews. Paul had been called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Two different areas of ministry, one to the Jews, the other to the Gentiles. Peter and Paul would both preach the same gospel, and the same Lord would be at work in and through them. But they would minister to different people groups. God calls people to different ministries in different places. We are called to preach the same gospel. 
And one seeking to work together and serve the one who is seeking together to build his church. Among those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, there really ought to be no competition. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm not... I don't believe we're in any competition with Middlebury Baptist Church. There's one gospel, and they proclaim that gospel. We have different ministries, but we're not in competition with them. There's enough unsaved unbelievers in Tioga County to fill every church full and overflowing and have multiple services, and we still would not reach everybody in Tioga County. Different ministries. Peter was a great man. He was a leading apostle. Yet he gladly cooperated with Paul and permitted him to carry on his ministry as the Lord would lead him. You got blanks there to fill in. Write this down. Different ministries, different methods, but one message. The message is the gospel of grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they affirmed. Different ministries, different methods, but one message. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. But they also had one request. That's the letter C, the, the last blank there to fill in. One request, and that was to remember the poor. The request was not a doctrinal, but it was kind of a practical reminder of the special needs of believers, especially in Judea. To take care of the poor is not just a practical, it's not only a practical, but it's a spiritual responsibility. Because to forsake that responsibility is to disobey God's word. 1 John 3, 17. We've been studying the, God, the, the book of 1 John on Wednesday nights online in our group. And I tell you what, 1 John is a challenging book. But John says this, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him. How can the love of God be in him? He says, look, if you don't help take care of the poor, if you have material possessions and you see someone in need, but you don't do anything to help that person, the love of God is not in you. James went so far. Now remember, Paul met with John. He met with James. James says that you're really a false believer if you refuse to help the poor. He says in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if, if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? You see, you really have no faith in God at all. You ever do that? Somebody comes to you with a need, somebody says... You know what our typical coined response is? I'll pray for you for that. And generally, we don't even do that. But it's a way of putting somebody off. Yeah, they have a need. And I can help them, but, I, you know, get a job. <laughs> A lot of jobs available, right? You ever hear somebody say that? Maybe you've said that. And God says, look, if you have the ability to help somebody and you don't, you have to ask yourself, is God's love really in you? We can't, we couldn't help ourselves, right? But God reached out to us. Jesus gave his life for us when we were helpless. And hopeless. Paul says, I'm eager to do that. He had always had interest in helping the poor. He gladly followed that request. Well, let me go through these. I got just a, a few takeaways here from this Jerusalem council. The first one is the importance of accountability. Paul didn't try to argue with those false teachers on his own. He went to the Jerusalem council. There was a method of accountability. 
And we need that to keep our doctrine and our understanding straight, whether it's the ministry in the church, the leadership in the church, whether it's the leadership of a denomination, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches, a lot of good people get led astray by independent people that will not submit to anybody but themselves. Number two, Satan works to bring division and confusion, especially within the church. Ephesians 4, 3, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. But I believe you would also say, without compromising the gospel of grace. You don't compromise to make peace. Number three, your acceptance and salvation is not based upon your performance or religious rituals. Your relationship with God is all about his grace, right? You are saved by grace through faith. You are sanctified by, you're not sure. <laughs> you are sanctified by grace through faith. You will be glorified by grace through faith. Nothing that you can do, nothing that you could ever accomplish, it's all by his grace. Even when I stand before God, then I hope that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. All I'm gonna be able to say it's because of your amazing grace. And number four is the importance of the work of the gospel. One message, agreement on the gospel of grace. Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, was buried for three days, rose from the grave on the third day, conquering the penalty of sin, which is death, and now provides for us eternal life as a free gift to all who will believe. Jesus ascended into heaven alive and living today. He's alive today, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's there making intercession for us. We serve a risen Savior. One message. But there's different ministries. We can be in fellowship with different ministries. We can work together to complete the Great Commission when we agree on the primary doctrine of the gospel of grace. Let's pray. Father, there's so much here. And I tried to squeeze it all in. But Father, maybe one of my brothers and sisters this morning are just filled with guilt, filled with pain. Maybe they feel separated from you because they're believing that lie of performance that somehow they just are not good enough. And in reality, Father, none of us are good enough. It's only by your grace that we receive that righteousness that you provide by your spirit. Father, perhaps someone this morning is just struggling to know you, to experience your grace and forgiveness. Holy Spirit, move upon them today. Help us to experience the freedom that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. Freedom to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, delivered from the law of Moses, delivered from the law of sin and death, released into your hands. 
I ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing.
Jesus, we pray in your name.